great to see all of you here this morning and great uh, to have all of you uh, with us who are watching online. Uh, today we are celebrating moms. Let's give it up for our moms. Yeah. If, uh, if you are a great mom, if you have a great mom, if you wish you were a great mom, um, I want you to answer this question. Um, what, would, uh, what are the qualities that you admire if you have a great mom, that you love about her, that you appreciate about her? What are the things that you really want to be, the kind of qualities you want to have if you are a mom? Um, live, I want, if you're here, uh, shout a couple things out. If you're watching online, uh, type it into the Facebook feed. What's, what makes a great mom? What do you look for? What do you want to be as a great mom? Like if you're here, I want to like... Mercy, right? We want somebody who is going to be gracious towards us. Encouraging. encouraging. Someone who's encouraging. Yep, great moms. What else? Unconditional love. Unconditional love, absolutely. We want a, mo a mom who's going to love us no matter what, and some of us need that more than others, right? Thank you. A great cook. That is a very, very fun quality to have in a mom. I have a mom who is a fantastic cook, and boy, uh, it is uh, much appreciated. And a wife who's a great cook. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Going to pay for that one later. <laughs> hey, um, we're celebrating Mom's Day. If you're, uh, if you're present here, if you're watching online, we have a special gift we want to give to you today. It's, it's not a lot, but just something to say, hey, we see you, we know you, we love you, we appreciate you. If you don't have the Church Center app, today is the day to get it because you can go onto that uh, Church Center app, uh, click on Watch Now, and if you do that, it's going to open it up, and it's going to be a place where you can fill out a welcome card, where you can donate, give to the uh, Journey of the Mission, where you can submit a prayer request, and there is going to be a place where you can submit uh, a, your information that will allow us to extend an, a special gift to you. So use the Church Center app. I think they're going to put a Facebook feed, uh, also a link to a Facebook um, that you can connect with that, but we want to honor you today with this special gift. We want to honor you today um, in, um, through God's Word. I'm going to open this morning. I'm going to talk about and read a, a scripture about um, one great mom. And the passage is, is from Matthew chapter 20. And the great mom is the, the mother of James and John, two of Jesus' disciples. The story picks up in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. It says, The mother of Zebedee, the Zebedee brothers, that's James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came with her two sons and knelt before Jesus with a request. What do you want, Jesus asked. She said, give your word that these two sons of mine will be awarded the highest place of honor in your kingdom, one of your right hand and one at your left hand. Right? This is a great mom. Right? She is advocating for her sons. She wants the very best for her sons, and she thinks that Jesus has the very best to offer them. So she's coming to Jesus saying, I want the best for my kids. I want them to have places of honor, opportunities to be, to be great people. And she doesn't fully appreciate exactly what it is that she's asking for. And I think a, a lot of moms and maybe a lot of parents in general struggle with that. Like we want things for our kids that we think will, um, you know, uh, serve them and serve the world well will be really great. I mean, you might want your, your uh, son or daughter to grow up to be like the leader of the free world. But, but if they do, there, there are some costs that come with that. There are some things that, 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 um, that will require of them that, that may not be so great. And Jesus just straight up says to, um, to the mother of James and John, she responded, you have no idea. You have no idea what you're asking. And he said to James and John, are you capable of drinking the cup that I'm about to drink? And they said, sure, why not? This is from um, Eugene Peter Peterson's The Message, colloquial, right, friendly. Jesus said, you are going to drink my cup, but as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. My father is taking care of that. Now, after this happens, after um, the mother of James and John comes and make this request to Jesus, the other disciples hear about it, and, and they, are, they are unhappy. They are furious because the, James and John's mom come to them, and Jesus' mom think it's it's like you know that they're 
they're, they're upset because the, the other disciples, James and John, are, are getting a leg up on them. It's like um, a mom who's, who is um, at the spelling bee, and her, and her kid is spelling the word, and the mom is sitting in, in the audience, and she's mouthing the letters to her son who's on the stage spelling the word, right? Just trying to give them a, a, an advance on, on and, and I actually saw that happen. So it's not just a, like, right? The mom is trying to get her kids, and the other disciples are like, uh-uh, uh-uh. So Jesus drew them together, and he said, You have observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be, be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. We're going to come back to those words, servant and slave, in a second. But Jesus continues, That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served. And then he, to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. Jesus says, I'm here to show you the way. I'm here to show you the way to greatness. And the path that I'm paving, the path that I'm leading you down is a path of descent into greatness. It's a path in which the more you serve, the greater you will become. And, and I'm, I'm not asking you to do something I'm not willing to do. I'm taking the lead. Follow me into service. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch it yet. Uh, I'm going to do a little commercial here for The Chosen. Uh, it's a, just a really, really cool um, presentation of the, of the life and ministry of Jesus. And, and it's not thoroughly, it's not all biblical. It's not like the, right, straight out of the text, but it, it's things that you could imagine would have happened in the lives of the disciples. And it's all based on, on specific um, biblical events. Really, really great um, uh, resource for you. Uh, you, can, you can get it by um, downloading the Chosen app on your, on your phone, and you can then actually project it to your TV through a number of different resources. But I, I mentioned that this morning because the Chosen app um, does, does such a great job of, of illustrating how the, the more Jesus served as he the disciples are always pushing him ahead, trying to, to get him to, to go public, trying to, to get him to do more, trying to kind of stage the, the show and, and bring greater attention to Jesus. And, and Jesus continually pulls away from that, but continues to serve. And the more he serves, the more he loves people, the more he engages with, with the, the less than and the other thans in society, the more attention, the more um, appeal that he has to people. He's, he's just like literally living out this call of becoming great through acts of love and service. If you want to be a great mom, Jesus says, right, not directly, but if you look at this story, right, um, the, the mother comes to Jesus, I want my sons to be great. And then Jesus teaches this, this lesson to his disciples. If you want to be great, okay, moms, if you want to be your, your kids to be great, teach them, train them, model for them service. Teach them to serve. Now, we're in um, a series that, that I've um, titled Uncommon Sense. Because common sense, right, is that, that we treat other people the way that we want to be treated. That, that seems like common sense. I've labeled it uncommon sense because what seems like is common sense has become decidedly uncommon in, in our culture. And, and we see, you know, more and more people struggling to, to treat others the way they want to be, to be treated and, and, and wanting people to be treated, to treat them that way, but not necessarily giving that away. How is it then that we live out, there's all these passages that Jesus, he instructed us to love one another. Love one another. As I have loved you. 
And then you see all these different one another's that unfold in the New Testament about what that looks like. Welcome one another, accept one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens, one another. This morning we come to serve one another, serve one another. Paul picks up this theme in, in his letter to the church at Galatia in chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Is, and, and the way that you love your neighbor as yourself is, is backs up and serve one another. Serve one another. Now, that, that word serve comes from uh, the, a word in Greek that, um, that actually means um, to be a slave or to be a waiter. Like you go to a restaurant, the person who comes to your table and, and takes care of you, who brings your food. Remember when we used to go to a restaurant? In fact, I went to a restaurant last night, like the first time and I don't know how long. It was such a beautiful experience. See, so we went to Seal Beach and sat on the, the sidewalk and, and somebody came up and they took an order and they brought us food. I mean, just it's fabulous, right? It's great to have waiters. And, and so that, it's that idea of, of serving, of waiting on other people. And it's not, it's a, it's, a, it's a service, it's a waiting that is born of freedom. We're not talking about a brutal, abusive, oppressive kind of slavery. You have been called to live in freedom. You've been called to live in freedom. Use your freedom, then, to love one another. Use your freedom to serve one another. Use your freedom to wait on others. Love, serve. And one of the, th the, one of the great things about this call to, to serve one another in, in a life of service is its simplicity and availability. I, I, there are little, you, you go anywhere, any time of day, any place, there are opportunities that avail themselves for us to serve other people. Because it doesn't have to be some great thing. It doesn't have to be some magnificent, right? Just a, a simple word of kindness or, you know, picking up trash when you're walking down the street or, or helping your neighbor out when they're doing something in their yard or, or doing something for a family, a friend, a, a neighbor. Or, you know, they're all kind. Everywhere we look, there are opportunities for us to, to be kind and to serve other people. It's little things that can make a big difference. Uh, among Jesus' most famous acts of service, maybe the one we talk about more than any of the other things that he did as an act of service, he did what? He washed his disciples' feet. Now, now think about that. Because they were incapable of washing their own feet? Because there was no one else that he could have ordered for them to wash their feet? He didn't do for them something they couldn't do or that couldn't have been done by It was a simple, simple little thing, not even something that was necessary. He did it as an act of service, as an expression of love. Just a little thing that goes down in history as being the call that Jesus uses. To serve. And the occasion is so special because it's, it's the last night of Jesus' life with his disciples. It's the last time that he's going to break bread together with them. And he's done all these things along the way that we're going to talk about, that, that people will talk about for generations and generations. But when he gathers on this, most holy, he says, I served you. I wash your feet. I want you to now go and wash one another's feet. When common sense is so uncommon, little things make even a bigger difference. One of the, the, the takeaways, one of the most beautiful things that's happened in the past year through the, through the pandemic for, for me and, and for my family is, is early on, um, our neighbors started a Tuesday night happy hour. 
And we just, people started coming out on Tuesday night, and, and everybody, you know, brought their own drinks and brought their own food, and, and you know, and we just set up lawn chairs, socially distanced, kind of spread out across a couple yards, and we just hung out together. And we're up to like, we have about 10 households that can, not everybody's everybody, but filters in and out. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of, a, it just kind of blows your mind. Not that, we, I grew up in a neighborhood like that. It's, it is, what blows my mind is such an anomaly. We're just kind of like, I can't believe this is happening. But it's not a big deal, but it's really a big deal because it is a big deal because people don't do that anymore. And we're just being kind to each other, and we're helping each other out, and we're doing little things. And it's a beautiful thing. Little things can make a big difference, are making a difference. And the reality is that some things that, that require service aren't little things. There, there are some things that happen in the course of a person's life that are more than any one person can bear. God is just. God is just. God is fair. God is, has put his image in every human being in such a way that every human being by design was created with the capacity and with the purpose and the intentionality of revealing something to the world about himself. We bear his glory. Every person. God is just. God is fair. Life in a sin-plagued world is not. There is, an, in a, in a sin-plagued, sin-broken world, there is an unequal distribution of assets. Right? Not everybody gets the same thing. Bill and Melinda Gates have been in the, in the news this week because they're divorcing after 20-plus years of marriage, and they're, and they're divvying up their 130 billion billion dollar assets, right? I, I don't know. That's not equal to me. And, and I've been in places, right, where, where what I have is, looks like $130 billion to someone else. I mean, comparatively, right? We, we don't have equal assets. We don't have equal ability, right? Bill Gates has all that money because he had this brain that allowed him to invent things and, and a personality and the abilities to do things that I can't do. There's an unequal distribution of assets. And there's also an unequal distribution of liabilities and hardships. I mean, do you know people? It's like they just, it seems like one thing after another, after another, after another has, ha happens to, to one person. It's like, how can anybody be expected to bear so much? And we all have our tale of woes. We all have our struggles. We all have our challenges. But some people seem to have a lot fewer, and some people need, seem to have a lot more. And some of that can be accounted for by initiative, by hard work, by responsibility, or because of irresponsibility, or because of laziness, or because of bad choices. Some of it can be, right? Some of us have different things because we've done different things with the opportunities that we've had. But some of it isn't. Some of it is attributed to the gene pool that we came from, right? Some of it is attributed to natural abilities that some of us have and others don't. Some of it has to do with what continent we were born on. If you were born in the United States of America, you have opportunities that people in other parts of the world will never have. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about forbearing one another. It was like putting up with. Sometimes we just have to put up with other people because, they're, because they have habits or practices that, that are annoying to us. And, and we, just, we, we forbear one another just so that we can continue to like do life together and get along. But, but today's call in, in service to the big things is not to forbear, but to bear for, to bear for one another. Again, from Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes to the church, carry each other's burdens. This word is, is borrows. It's different from service. Carry each other's burdens, 
in the way, in that way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should t- test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. He starts out, carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens. Carry for each other. Help each other with something that is too heavy for any one person to carry. Help each other with one of those, with those things. Because of a person's limitations, or because the weight of the need is, is greater than any one person can bear. Carry each other. Help each other with those things. And I, and I love the fact, and I think we have to remind each other, and I think this is a, a unique word for moms, right? That it says what? It says to carry each other's burdens. Which means not only that we are called to help other people carry their burdens, but that we're also called to allow other people to help us carry our burdens. That, that mutuality of this commandment, this, this call to, to, to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens, says that sometimes we need to swallow our own pride and allow other people to help us. And I think sometimes moms feel like they have to carry the weight of the world for everyone. And sometimes it's simply saying, I can't do this. I need help. I need help. And for some, that is really, really hard to do. It says, carry each other's burdens. And then at the end of the passage, he says, and carry your own load. That that we share our burdens and we carry our load. As we take responsibility for that which is ours that we're responsible for. That there are some things in life that, that we are meant to bear. Individually, personally, as, as human beings created in the image and likeness of God who were in the garden, right, that God assigned to Adam and Eve the responsibility to fill the garden, to multiply, to fill it, and to rule over it, that we're called to lead. We're called to rule over things, to be responsible, to take charge of those things. Paul says that the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Not the one who is unable to work, The one who is unwilling to work, the one who is unwilling to carry their own load shall not eat. At times, there there may be burdens that make it impossible even for one to carry their own load, right? They may have, we may be carrying a weight that is so much that we can't, we're we're under that weight. We need somebody to help us carry our load burden and our load, but even in helping people in that place, the, 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 the call is to, to lighten their load so that they can then carry their burdens. And it's important to hear both parts of this, because what happens when a person doesn't carry our load, when we don't carry our load, then other people end up carrying our load for us. Then they can't share in other burdens because they're carrying our load that doesn't belong to them. It's called, even in serving one another, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. One of my... um, personal passions and one of my family's passions that they learned over time. It was a journey, but um, we, I, th- I think I can say, safely say, we love to backpack. We, we love to get out in, in the wilderness and go places where you can only go with the things that you're carrying, that you can carry. And backpacking provides a, just such a great illustration of, of what this looks like. When you pack, when you pack you're taking everything that you're going to use. 
and everybody has a pack that they're carrying, and everybody has to carry their own stuff in that pack. Their own stuff, it means you have to carry your own sleeping bag. You have to carry your own um, clothes that you're going to wear. You have to carry your own utensils, your own cup, and the things that you're going to eat on. You have to carry your own, um, um, like, toothbrush and toothpaste. Everybody carries their own load. But then everybody also has community gear, gear that they have to carry. Right? That, that not everyone needs a tent. If you have a three-man tent, if you have a one-man tent, then everyone does. But if you have a three-person tent, right, then only one person has to carry that. Three people get to sleep in it. It's community gear. And then somebody else carries the, the cooking utensils, and somebody else carries the water filters, and all these things that, 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 the, that the team needs, that the community needs to accomplish the purposes, each according to their ability. Right? When we first started out, my kids could, I, I didn't start backpacking until every kid could carry their own sleeping bag and pillow and, and, and pajamas. But once they could, they all carried that. And Deb and I carried just about everything else. But then they grew up, and they got bigger, and they're stronger. And as they did, I started downing more of our packs into their packs. And they got bigger and stronger. And they're like, we're walking down the trail, and they're, you know, 300 yards ahead of us. Like, the next time we stop, it's like, drop your pack. You need a few more things. You know, you got to slow down so we can speed up. Each according to their ability. And, <clears throat> and, and there might have been some times when there was some squibbling. You know, like, I carried the tent yesterday. You have to carry it today. Or, or your bear container that has all the food in it is, weighs more than my con- bear container. And, and, you know, like maybe, not often, but, but if somebody went down, if somebody had an injury, everyone was fighting over who would take the gear of that person. Right? We carry our own load. We share our burdens. And when someone needs help, we rise up and we step into the, into the gap and we fill that gap as a community with each other, for each other. And when everybody's carrying their own load and everybody's sharing the burdens, you know what happened? When the kids were little and we're carrying the load and they're doing the best of their ability, we might go three miles in a day or four miles. And as everybody grows up and they, their capacity increases and we're sharing more equitably, right, we can go 8 miles or 10 miles or 12 miles, and we can accomplish more when we're carrying our burden and sharing our load. Some moms, right, moms would climb Mount Everest and carry all of their kids' gear to secure the very best for them. Sacrificing everything at whatever cost was necessary, which is totally appropriate when a child has a burden that they cannot bear. But we have this phenomenon in our culture, some people, they call it helicopter moms, who want to to lighten their kid's load to protect them from risk, to shelter them from struggle, who would do almost anything and maybe sometimes even everything for their kids. You know, Jesus, forget this cup stuff. I want my kid to be at the head of the class. Forget the struggle, the strife, the suffering that comes. I want my kid to be the head of the class. I want them to be in front. Jesus, would you secure for them a place in the world that doesn't require anything of them, and I'll help them get there. I'll advocate for them. And to be fair, it isn't just moms. I I read a book recently. I'm still kind of processing it um, by... uh, a professor from a local school um, seminary. His name's J.P. Moreland. He wrote a book called Finding Quiet. It's actually a book about um, anxiety and depression. And in the book, he talks about um, a book that was written in 1979 called The Culture of Narcissism by an author named Christopher Lash. Okay, 1979, Culture of Narcissism. We think this is a new thing. 
It's got kind of a long history. And in the book, The Culture of Narcissism, and I'm reading um, J.P. Moreland's analysis of it, it says around 1958, there's, therapists began to see an ex escalation of patients who did not suffer from any specific problem. Instead, they suffered from a vague, ill-defined anxiety slash depression that seemed to signify an underlying change in the organization of personality from what has been called an inner direction to narcissism. Something had gone wrong with the American psyche itself, which had become numb with pervasive feelings of emptiness and a deep fracture in self-esteem. More and more Americans were preoccupied with their own self-absorbed needs along with instant gratification of desire. As a result, they found it impossible to form intimate relationships with others and to live for something bigger than themselves that gave them meaning in their lives and respect to which they could play a role. In America, we became so obsessed with ourselves and taking care of our needs that we became, instead of interdirected towards others, narcissistic towards ourselves, and the result is anxiety and depression. It's not the only cause of anxiety and depression. There's a lot of other factors that go into it, other things too. This way, right? In his words, anyone who seeks to save their life will lose it. Anyone who makes their life about their life will lose life. And sometimes helping more is doing less. Jesus follows anyone who seeks to save their life will lose it, but anyone who loses their life for me will find it. Another book that I read recently is by an author named Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor and also a psychiatrist, which kind of brings an inter interesting perspective to being, enduring that kind of suffering and then watching and analyzing how people process the suffering. And he was just determining, trying to assess how is it that some people survived could not or did not. And some of it was just pure random luck. You showed up the wrong day, you're in the wrong spot, and you got killed. But for some people, they just simply gave up, and others never did. And he, and he asked the question, why? And, and this was his observation, that people who found something to live for beyond their experience, who had something to say, when I'm done with this, I have something to do that matters, so I need to live for, for me to fulfill that purpose, that calling. Lived. And the people who didn't ultimately gave up, lost hope, and died. He says it this way, he who knows the why for his existence will be able to hear, bear almost any how. Any, the person who knows their why can bear almost any how. So my call this morning is to practice your serve. To practice your serve. And, and the first two, just two questions that are an audit. Just an audit of how you're doing right now. Am I carrying my own load? And am I teaching? And maybe the right word is allowing my kids to carry theirs. Am I carrying my load? Am I teaching, training, equipping, resourcing my kids to carry their load? Second question. Am I sharing in the burden of others? And am I sharing my own burdens with others. The things that are too heavy to carry, am I helping other people carry those things and I allowing people to help me carry those things? Two audits and an action. The action is this. 
not just to serve, plan to serve. Make commitments to serve. Uh, random acts of kindness became famous um, a while back. And I, random act, acts of kindness are great. You know, if you have a, see an opportunity, seize the opportunity, that, that's a beautiful thing to do. I love it. But random acts of kindness in my own life are largely built on how I'm feeling in any given day. Right? If I'm in a good mood, I might do a random act of kindness. And if I'm in a bad mood, I probably won't. And the more I'm in a bad mood, the worse mood I get in and the less acts of kindness I do, and it actually becomes a snowball. And we're free, right, to do what we feel like doing when we're, when, when we're doing it. But, but we're called not to, to use our freedom to indulge ourselves, but to use our freedom to serve others, to make commitments. I can wake up on a Saturday morning, say like yesterday morning, right, and wake up and it's food pantry Saturday. And I'm going to serve. And I wake up in the morning and it's like, ah, I don't really feel like going today. But I plan to be there. People are expecting me to be there. People are counting on food being distributed. Where are people who is counting on you to be there for them? Who can count on you? Plan, commit, and show up. And moms, and I love this because we had a whole group of moms here today, yesterday, and they all had their kids in root. Teach your kids to serve. Jesus says it is the path to greatness. Lord, I'm so grateful for my mom, for my um, wife is a great mom. My mom's a great mom too, and my wife's a great mom. And, um, and for so many great moms that, um, that I get to share life together with, that are part of our Junity family, that are part of our community, I pray that you bless them today, encourage them, strengthen them, give them wisdom and guidance as they seek to fulfill their callings that you've uniquely placed on their lives with every child who's different and has different needs. Lord, bless them in that. I pray for people today who are grieving the absence of their moms, moms who have, who have gone before them into, into glory. God, would you comfort them in their loss, in their sorrow, in their grief. Bless them uniquely today. I pray for those who have um, deep wounds because um, their moms whose kids um, have um, been cut off from them because of things that they've done or because of the things that their kids have done, because of life in a broken world and challenges for moms who are, who are bearing great heartache today, for kids who are break, bearing great heartache today because of those relationships. God, you are a God of, of healing and reconciliation. I pray that you would move in just maybe subtle ways, even today, that would lead to a beginning peace that would lead to healing and restoration. God bless and come for those moms. Pray for women who long to be moms and for physical reasons or just not being in the right time or right place or not being in a covenant relationship, Lord, that that's not available to them. Bless them too. For every person who is a mom or wants to honor a mom today. God, your grace, your peace, your love, your mercy, your wisdom, your help, your hope, your strength. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.